Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the WXCL Book Club. Um, we are going to be honored today by having James Swain, author of Dark Magic, here on July 18th, 2013. I'm Tina Puglisi, and I'm sitting in for Ann Bocock, who is our regular moderator. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Swain. Um, he's a national best-selling author of 14, I think it's 16 now, right? 16. 16 mystery novels and has been published in the U.S., France, Japan, Russia, Germany, and Bulgaria. His books have been chosen as Mysteries of the Year by Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Reviews and have received three Barry Award uh, nominations, a Florida Book Award for Fiction, and France's prestigious Prix Calibre 38 for Best American Crime Fiction. His Tony Valentine series was re recently purchased by Langley Films of Cops and Brooklyn Finest with uh, James Swain set to write the screenplay. Are you doing that? Just about. Okay. And along with writing novels, James Swain is considered one of the world's foremost sleight of hand artists and an authority on gambling, cons, and swindles. Now it's my pleasure to welcome James Swain to the WXEL Book Club. Thank you very much. And I believe he, I believe he's going to do some sleight of hand, cons, sure. something. Why don't you do something for us? He just, he just, he just did when I was talking before my wallet's gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Jake, that's okay. That's good. And how to win a poker? How to win a poker? Well, thank you, and thank you for coming out. Um, and I want to thank the station for having me here. Um, I have been writing my whole life. Uh, I started writing when I was a kid in school. I fell in love with it, and um, at the same time I started writing, I started performing magic. Uh, I fell in love with magic as a kid, and they th they've been sort of parallel things in my life. And several years ago, uh, a publisher in New York approached me, and he said, I'm a native of New York, and he said, I have this idea about a magician. I'd like, would you be interested in writing some books about him? And I said, okay. And he said, but you don't remember me, but when I was a little boy, I saw you do a magic show. You picked me. Came up and I helped you. And I've always remembered you, and when I saw you were writing novels. So, long story short, that resulted in a character named Peter Warlock, and um, this book, Dark Magic, and now its sequel has just been published, called Shadow People. So that's how I got to do this. Um, the fun thing about the book is that Peter is a magician. He has a show in New York where he performs, but he's also a psychic, and he gets together with a group of other psychics once a week on Friday night, and they do seances, and they look into the future, and sometimes they see bad things, and they try to alert the police on what's going to happen, and that's the basis of the stories, and um, I think they're a lot of fun. My readers seem to be having a good time with them, but the fun thing about it is that I got to write about something that I really enjoy, which is magic, which I've been doing I won't say for how long, I'm just gonna say it's been for many decades, <laughs> okay? And um, it's fun to write about someone who's doing something that you like to do. So I'm gonna ask if I will have, Tina can help me, you're sitting right here. This gentleman here, Paul, would you like to come up and um, I'm only gonna pick on you for a little bit. Should have said nothing. Should have said nothing, ha <laughs> ha. I picked Paul because he has a beautiful shirt. And here he goes, See, please sit right there. Thank you very much, thanks for coming up. Tina, thanks for assisting me. Um, I'm gonna start out with something very simple deck of cards. This is how we count them in the old country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful girl. Thank you. Oh, Tom. Just, just kidding. Just kidding. Called the Devil's Prayer Book. Here we are. Take a little hair. Voila. Thank you. Now, Tina, would you move in a little closer? See, they're all different? Yes. Okay. Not like the cards they show on TV, where they're all, every other card's the same. Okay. I'm going to give them a little shuffle. Do you know what they call that? No. Showing off. <laughs> okay. You should have known. Now, I'm going to have, um, Tina, do you play cards? Not really. Not really. Okay. No. Perfect. Perfect for stop. Would you just say stop? Stop. Right there? You could have stopped me at any card. Oh, but look. 
stop me at an ace of diamonds. Had you stopped me one lower or one higher, I would not have gotten an ace. Now, my job will be to find the ace's brothers. They're brothers. He has three brothers. Ace of clubs. <laughs> you can save your applause to the big finish at the end, okay? <laughs> Okay, we'll try this again. There now should be an ace on the bottom of the deck, disguised as a two. <laughs> oh, oh, now he's good, now he's good, okay? And we'll do this one more time. And hopefully, an ace got, no, I got a queen. Apologize. This happens sometimes. Ready? Watch. Oh. Oh. Thank you. My father used to refer to as a wasted youth. Okay? Now, Tina, I'm going to ask you to help me. Okay. I have the four aces. I have the black aces and the red aces. Which do you like more, the red or the black? The red. The red. What I'm going to ask you to do is put your hands out like so and cross at the wrists like that. Perfect. Keep your hands, palms flat. Here's what we're going to do. So it's going to be in your hands. The ace of diamonds will go in your right hand. The ace of hearts will go in your left hand. Now. At the count of three, I'm going to make them switch places while they're in your hands. <laughs> but before I do that, I'd like to spend a minute talking to you about Amway products. <laughs> Just a little joke. For, for those of us a little older, that's funny. Okay? Ready? One, two, two and a half. And look, they switch. No, no, no. They, re they, re they really did. Look, she has... Oh, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> Gotten everybody excited about this. Yeah. This is good. Okay. Now I'm going to um, going to try something a little different. As I said in the books, Peter um, does some interesting things in the book because he's not only a, a, a magician but he's also a oh, come on cooperate. He's a psychic, and in researching the books. I had to learn about mind reading, psychics, and I've always thought the things that I was seeing on television and the mind readers and stuff, it was, it was all faked. And I discovered that a lot of the things really weren't what I thought they were, that's the best way to put it. What I discovered is you can't read minds, but you can read thoughts. That's what poker players do. They look in the other person's face and they say to the player, they say, he's bluffing or he's not bluffing. Women are very good at this. That's why when a, a guy breaks up with a girl, a woman never wants it over the phone. She wants to look at it while he's saying it. Go figure. Okay, here I have a die. Okay, it's an ordinary die. It was given to me by a gift many years ago from a friend in Las Vegas. It's slightly larger than most dice. A die, normal die, has interesting characteristics. The sides always add up to seven. So if there's a one there, there's a six there. If there's a three there, there will always be a four there. If there's a five here, there's a two there. That's how you know it's a normal die. You just saw that. Now, Tina, I'm going to ask you to take the die, and here's what you're going to do. I'm going to turn my back. You're going to pick one of the six numbers. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's say, for an example, you pick three. It would be the number that's on the top. You would cover it with your hands like that, and you can just rest your hand, I'm going to move these, rest your hands right here on the table. Okay. Or if you don't want to, you can put them in front of you. Okay. No one else has to see this, you don't let, have to let the camera see it, it's your choice. And I'm going to turn my back, okay? Okay. You have a number? Yes. Did anyone else see it? No. no. Sure? No one else saw it? You didn't see it, Paul? No. no. Okay, terrific. Now. I've got the cards here on the table. 
Okay? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First, how old were you when you first learned how to drive? Sixteen. Sixteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. What is your favorite day of the week? Friday. Friday, mine too. F R I D A Y. What is your favorite color? Blue. My favorite color too. B L U E. And finally, the most important question of all Coke or Pepsi? You can say neither. 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 Okay. Right. About half the people say neither. N E I T H E R. Tina, there's no way that I could know how old you were when you first learned to drive, your favorite day being Friday, your favorite color being blue, and when asked Coke or Pepsi, you would say neither. For the first time, would you open your hands? and let everyone see the number that you picked. Five. The number that Tina picked was five. Does the camera see it? Everyone sees it? Now, playing cards have been used to predict the future for thousands of years. Let's see if they were accurate. Oh, look. There's the five of clubs. Oh, my God. Oh, the five of hearts. That's amazing. The five of spades. Wow. Amazing. Holy cow. Thank you. How long did it take you to learn one of these? Let's see. Today is Thursday. Um, it takes a little while. Uh, <laughs> That's a smart aleck answer, but it, it, I've been doing, as I said, I've been doing magic for, um, uh, for, for well over 40 years. That particular routine is something that I created while I was doing the books. Uh, it's my own, um, something I'm very proud of, but it, it gives you an idea of really mind, re you know, the world has changed in the last just 20 years alone, and so has the world of magic. Um, because when I was researching the books, I was, I was seeing things that just simply made no sense to me. I'll give you an example. I'll do it again with the die. Paul, you were probably perplexed by that. Here, what I'd like you to do is do the same thing that Tina did. You get to pick a number. You don't let, have to let anyone else see it. Cover it with your hands. But here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stand over here. I don't know if the camera can see me. Can the camera see me? Do you have a number, Paul? I do. Did you by chance pick one? I sure did. You did. Do, do another number. Do another one. Please, please, please. Do another one. Everybody picks one. I don't know why. Yes. <laughs> he knew my he knew my limits. <laughs> now you can go back and pick. Uh, sorry. I got it. Go on, Alan. Paul, did you pick one again? <laughs> I'm a creature of habit. Yes, I did. <laughs> one more time. One more time. And you can go back and pick one again. Can I ask you a question, Paul? Did you go with another number first before you pick the one a second time? No. Okay, okay. Yeah. Try one more time. Okay. I hear everyone yelling six. So if that's it, please change. Did a couple of different numbers, yes? You're right. I but, you set, but you settled on five? I sure did. Oh. Oh. You picked up the confusion in my mind. You picked huh? up the confusion. Are you married? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I do not want to live with this guy. It too much. Um I try something. This is this is kind of interesting. Um it shows you how long I've been around. This was one of the original, I'm one of these people who doesn't throw away anything. I'm, I'm driving a car that I've had for a long time and I just, that was the way I was raised. I think it was because my folks were depression people. Um, but this I bought many years ago, actually when I lived in New York and it's a traveling time clock. It was made by Timex. I think Timex is still around. I think they are, good, okay. Um, but it's a great little clock. It works, it's always worked and but it has an interesting feature to it. It has a carry, carrying case. 
And oh, let me show you here. It has buttons. So if I hit the minute button, the minutes change. See? And if I hit the hour button, the hours change. Okay? You put it in the carrying case and you can hit those buttons. And of course, you can see that everything changes. All right? Now, I'm going to close this. Tina, I want you to start pushing those buttons. See those two buttons there? These mm -hmm. two? Start pushing them. The top one and the bottom one? Either here? one. As many times as you want. Don't let me see. Oh, the top one, I think, changes the time. So don't push that. That changes it to an alarm. But that actually changes the setting. Okay, so, and I'll turn, I won't even look, I'm going to make a prediction. Okay. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Yeah, yeah, okay. so there's no way I could know what it was. Okay. You all done? I'm done. Okay. Let's take it out and... What's the time? 3.03. What's the time? 303. <gasps> That's what I wrote. <laughs> and see, look. Changes. Oh my god. Okay. Yay. That is you like that, huh? Yeah. Okay. Clock always stops at 303. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I wish it was that easy. Um, one of the fun things about being a writer is that I get to, um, I have a lot of books, I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm still a, um, there are e-books and there are tree books. These are tree books. Uh, and I have a variety of different libraries. And several years ago, I got to inherit my dad's library, which was thousands of volumes. My dad used to like to go to uh, backyard sales, and he would buy paperbacks, voracious reader. And these were some that I got from his uh, Play Ball by Royce Kilbrew, which is actually pretty good. Um, the Rochenko Target, which is a um, thriller, a um, instant intuition, and um, bl uh, Brooklyn Bloodbath, which actually isn't that bad. Um, <coughs> Tina, I'd like you to, to pick one. Okay? Paul, I'd like you to pick one. Went for the baseball book. Cool. What I'd like you to do is look through the books and see that they're real books. All right? I want to be accused of using fake books. And what I want you to specifically look at are the words on the top of the page, because that's what we're going to use. OK? All different? Now, here's what we're going to do. Tina, I'm going to take the book. I'm, the, I'm going to go like that. And I'm going to ask you to memorize the word that's right there. OK? Mm -hmm. so, do you see one? Yep. Okay. Well, that was the one you just, do you want to use that word? Yeah. You sure? Because yes. that was, I, I saw the word. Oh, you did? You, you okay. know, it was footsteps. Yeah. Well, I, that's where I opened to. Okay. So, so if you, you, you just open anywhere you want to. Okay. Just go ahead and open. Got one? <laughs> yes. You saw one? Yes. Okay. Don't forget it. Please don't. Okay, what I would like each of you to do, remember, I can't read minds, but I can read thoughts. I would like each of you to think of the first letter of your word. Okay, just think. Okay, I'm getting one of the letters that I'm getting looks like that. Uh, it's a C. Is that yours? That yours. Ah, okay. I show it to you first. You're smiling. Okay. Let's go with you. Um, first letter is a C. Think of the second letter. Um, it is an O. That correct? It is cool. Think of the third letter. Think of the whole word. I'm 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 seeing people playing tennis. Why am I seeing people playing tennis? Is a tennis court, but it wasn't tennis court. It's just court. 
court. Okay, but you were thinking tennis court. You were thinking tennis court. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna try the same thing with Paul. Um, first letter. Um, I saw just a, a word, which was the word A. It's not the word A, is it? But the word has the word A. That's the first letter, isn't it? You want me to a? remember the first letter of that page? Of that word. No, that word. Yeah. The word you're thinking of. The word is A. There's actually three words that I looked at. You did. A. Okay. A. 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 Canadian. A. Um, the second letter I see is, I see the word long. A. Is it a long? Yeah. It is long. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, now we're, now we're building up to the big finale, I have to say. Um, and um, this has always, this has been, um, when, I, when I started to look at the psychics, when I started to look at the people who read minds, this was something that I saw done and I said, that doesn't look possible. And, and I realized it doesn't work all the time. I have to be able to work with people, because part of mind reading is, if people are going to fight you, um, or they're going to block off their thoughts. It's sort of like hypnosis. I don't know if you realize this, but a large portion of the population cannot be hypnotized. They don't want to be, so they can't be. Same thing is pretty true with mind reading. Um, but um, this is done with a book. And one of the fun things about being a writer is I get to go to conferences, mystery conferences. And there was a mystery conference um, over in uh, Sarasota. Dan Jennings came to it and was nice enough to um, give me this book he self-published, he even uh, autographed it to me, um, and it's actually quite good. Um, i take this out for a second. Tina, do you need your glasses for this? Thing? Probably. The print's pretty good. <laughs> I'll ask you to use them. Okay, here's what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm going to stand just a little bit away from you so you don't think I'm seeing what you're doing. I'd like you to look through the book. Approximately how many pages are in the book? Around 300, so I remember. 295. 295, close enough for government work. Okay, around 300 pages, 300 words plus to a page, so there's about 100,000 words in that book. I'd like you to open up to any spot in the book. I'm not going to see where you look, but where you open to. What I'm asking you to do is start to read. Okay? You, uh, you pick either page. You pick either, either, either Anywhere page. on the page I can start to read? Yes. Okay. Well, you can start at the top, you start in the middle. Here's okay. what I want you to do. I want you to choose mentally a word on the page. But not an ordinary word, not a word like I or the. I want you to pick a long word. The longer the word, the more difficult, more challenging this will be for me. Do you have a word? Yes, I do. You do. Would you please close the book up? No one knows what that word is but you. No. You can place the book down if you'd like to. Okay? Now, I brought my trusty pad. Again, we have 100,000 words to work with, a lot of words. I'm going to ask you just to send me, think of the word, imagine in your mind, think of your mind as like a theater screen, which is how we do imagine things, is like a theater screen. I wonder what people did before movies, but that's how we see things now. Think of that first letter of the word, okay? Okay. I'm going to write down the first impression I get. That's it. I'm committed. What was the first letter of the word that you're thinking of? P. P. Okay. Um, I got an S. Isn't that great? Okay. <laughs> but there was, there was a word associated with this S. All right? And the word I got with the S was security. Is there a relationship to the word you're thinking of to security? Yes. There is. Okay, then we're on the right track. Think. Um, the word can actually be broken into two words. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it's a lot of um, two words. Let's work on the last word. Mm -hmm. Last word, first letter, is a W. Yes. Is the letter that follows that O? Yes. M? Mm -hmm. Is the word woman? Okay, so the last half of the word is woman, first half is P, O, policewoman. Yes! That was it. Yeah. That was it. Wow! Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, thank you.
Any questions? Hi. Just kidding. How are you doing? Thank you very much. Well, I have some I have some questions yeah. for Certainly. you. Sit down. Okay. Sit down. Now, um, tell us how you arrived at this marriage between magic and fiction. Um, well, you know, I was asked about writing a book about a um, a magician, specifically a magician in New York, because ma ma New York has always been sort of a hotbed of magic in the United States. That's where Harry Houdini lived. Um, many of the great magicians worked on Broadway. Um, um, Doug Hennings worked on Broadway, and The Magic Show, for those of you who remember that phenomenal show, David Copperfield's worked on Broadway. So it just made sense that I would pick New York. Um, I thought about doing it in Las Vegas, but that just doesn't seem to be the same. New York is so rich in history. And one, one of the things that takes place in the book, Peter being a psychic, I went and talked to a lot of psychics. And, I, and, and many of the psychics I talk to believe in ghosts, and they believe in spirits. And you talk to people in New York, and practically every old house has a spirit. And throughout the book, Peter, you know, these spirits talk to Peter, and they're quite lively. You know, they're, they're quite interesting, and, and they have a, a lot of interesting things to sort of, and it, to me that was just a very fun, um, intriguing, you know, when, when you write books, you're looking for intriguing characters. And here's a young guy who has to deal with the real world, but he also has to deal with this, this other world that is around there in the city all the time. Um, and, you know, when, when I first moved here to Florida, my wife and I lived in a house, and we were told the house had a ghost. And uh, magicians are skeptics. We are skeptics by nature. And I thought, well, that's just a bunch of bunk. You know, that's nice. But And then one morning I woke up and I looked across the room and there was this very old person sitting in a chair just looking at me, very benign, sort of smiling, and then they were gone. And I said, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife saw, um, saw this too, later, not the same time. So sort of changed my opinion about it. Well, why do you think audiences are so intrigued uh, with magic? And, and why do we choose to suspend disbelief? Um, you know, magic, um, I, I'm going to have to use my, my introduction to magic, or the thing that drew me to magic, was Harry Houdini. Uh, when I was a kid, I saw a magician, and then I went to a magic shop in New York, it was really dating me, and the man who owned the shop had been a friend of Houdini's. Okay, now Houdini died in 26, mm -hmm. so this gentleman, his name was Al Flosso, he was, a, he was a bit on in years. But Houdini was, was a, a, a transformational figure for this country because he, became, he, had, he had been performing since 1876, but he became popular in 1900 because the country was going into a new century. We had millions of immigrants coming over, and this notion that you could, you could change yourself, which is literally Houdini could get out of anything, and he had a trick called metamorphosis, where he and his wife would change places. And it gave people who saw him this wonderful sense, well, I can do that too. I can escape these chains that have held me down. I can, I can be a new person. Look, look at this immigrant. He's an immigrant. Um, and look how he changed himself. And so he became a very, um, you know, he was one of the, the few people in our, um, in our culture, you know, whose name actually became a verb to do a Houdini, you know, he's a Houdini. I mean, he, he became part of the vernacular. So that's to me what, was, what drew me to magic. And uh, um, American magicians have continued to do that since then. He's still the sort of the standard. Well, who do you think is at the top of the field today? Um, you know, I'm still very partial to David Copperfield, but we knew each other as kids. Did you really? Yeah. We Tell had, us about that. We had a, the same magic teacher. Uh, David used to come into a magic store in New York, and a uh, store that I would go into, and um, we were friends. We went to some magic conventions together. Our parents were friends. They did some things while we would go out and do the magic stuff together. And then um, I decided to go into, actually went into college, and that's where I got really interested in writing. And then David went and uh, did a show, I believe it was in, broad, uh, in Chicago, called The Magic Man. 
and then that sort of launched his career and he became became who he is today. But he and David Blaine, um, and then there are a number of other very, very, very talented magicians now. Well, some of the, um, some of the things that um, uh, David Copperfield did, uh, does are pretty dangerous looking. Um, are, are, is he at risk for injury, or are, they, are performers that do those kind of things? He floats and he does all these strange things. That, um, is that I, dangerous? Well, if you don't know what you're doing, yeah, um, and I know Houdini hurt himself a few times in his career, but really the, 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 the sort of like a tightrope walker, most of the time when they act like they're wobbling, that's rehearsed, okay? okay? Um, you really don't want to put your life at risk. It makes it very hard to get insurance. Uh, <laughs> so, but I do think there have been things that David has done in some of his specials that you know, they had to make sure that nobody got hurt. Magicians, let me put it another way to take it outside of just David. Magicians have gotten hurt. Magicians do the catching the bullet trick, uh, which is very dangerous. Anytime someone's pointing a gun at you um, and have been shot, um, a magician down in Mexico was killed doing an escape, a straitjacket escape. Anytime you allow yourself to be bound, you're putting yourself at risk. So yeah, there, there there are some things with it um, that are can be um, precarious. Well, does it bother you that there are some spoilers out there who really like to reveal how these uh, illusions are occurred to their audiences? I, I, I'm at odds with some of the people in the worlds of magic because that doesn't really bother me. Um, it, first of all, I don't think you can stop it in the age of the internet, and secondly, I think that if, if I show you how something is done and I come back an hour later and I do it a little differently, I'll still fool you. I'll still fool you with it. I, I can be creative enough to take the idea and fool you with it. Um, I remember I, I, did, I did some DVDs for magicians several years ago where there were a, a number of instructions. So you saw the tricks and then you saw the explanation. And I had a friend at the house staying over, and um, my wife had left the DVDs, I think, or one of us had left the DVDs in the player, and he was watching them. And he was watching the trick, and then he was watching the explanation. And he called me into the room, and he said, these two things don't go together. <laughs> the explanation made no sense to him. It absolutely made no sense. It, it just raised more questions about what is going on. Ma magic is quite complicated. The, the, the answers to the things you see are not simple. You know, it's, it's very much an art, the way people like David or Penn and Teller, it's a real art form that they've spent decades. So uh, showing how a simple thing is done on the internet, I, I don't care about it. I don't think it, I don't think it sticks with people. So, but again, I'm, I'm in the minority. Most magicians get very upset by it. Well, the psychics in your book, Peter and his crew that met on Friday nights, are they based on real magicians and psychics that you know, no. or did you just make these people they're, up? They're from my imagination. You have a very vivid imagination. Right. Thank there. you, I do. <laughs> Hope so. Now, your writing seems um, so effortless. Do you find it easy to just sit down and write? Um, you know, one, one of the things of having done this for a while is I... I'm encountered by a lot of people who want to write. Because uh, writing is a second career for me. I owned an advertising business for 20 years. And I longed to write. And I learned a secret about writing, that when you read something and it, it just flows, it just flows. Um, that book was probably written 10 times. My average book has nine drafts. And, 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 and as I, I progress through it, the drafts get quicker. But you, my goal is to make you finish the book. My goal is to get you to the end of the book. Um, I, I can't stand when I'm reading books where they just stop, where it just sort of stops dead. And I'm like, why am I moving forward with this? And I had a writing teacher when I was in high school, um, a woman named Kitty Lindsay. And Miss Lindsay had a wonderful expression. And she would say, 
when referring to a story or a novel, who, and she was Southern, so I'll try to, I'll, I, will, I will mimic her wonderful accent. She would say, who are these people and why should we care about them? And I think if you create characters that readers will care about and you tell them who they are, then the story will just move itself forward. Um, I find with writing that I, I believe um, that I've gotten better. I've published 16 books now, and I believe over time my writing has gotten progressively better. Um, but it's not easier. It doesn't get easier. It still is a gar to write a novel. Anytime I see someone's written a novel, to me it's a gargantuan task, and I want to hug them <laughs> because it means you saw through. And so many people write, have great books in them, but they don't want the struggle. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that one of my editors is my wife. And she's a very hard to have a spouse be your editor. Um, on her, on, for her, not for me, because she's a great editor. But she, she has, she can. We're close enough that she can write the word bull s in the margin. And I can immediately realize I got to fix that. I'm not going to be offended by it. Um, but when you, you write, you have to have people who will critique the books, who will rip them apart. You don't want people telling you how good you are. You want to be able to reach it to the point where I can give it to you and you can go read it. Or a lot of my readers will contact me and say, I read your book in two days. I read your book in a day. And that meant we did it right. We got it right. Um, long answer to your question. Well, but. What is your writing discipline? I mean, do you get up in the morning and you know write a chapter, write a page? What, what discipline do you have to make your, your books? Well, 14 books, 16 books? 16. Yeah, I, I try to write every day. Um, and when I'm in the middle of a novel, then it really starts to, I almost have to pull myself back because it starts to go too quickly. And I realize I'm making, I have to be making mistakes if it's going that quickly. Um, one of the books I wrote, Midnight Rambler, um, I wrote the first draft in nine weeks. I've never written anything that quickly. I don't remember writing parts of it. Um, I then subsequently had to do many, many more drafts after that. But uh, I tend to like to write at night. Um, there are no interruptions at night. I like the tranquility of it. I think it's because for the 20 years that I had the ad business, I was writing books that weren't getting published and I was working at night. So, you know, and I also like, I just like when it's quiet, when the, the phone isn't ringing, there's no interruptions. We have dogs, the dogs are usually around my feet. You know, they kind of let me know when it's time for a break, you know, um, and so, but I'm, the world of magic taught me discipline, all right? And so I, I've come into it with discipline. And most of the writers I know are very, very disciplined very, very disciplined people, very focused. Well, you've written 16 novels. When you start one, do you know in your mind what's going to happen throughout the whole thing and all you have to do is put it on paper? How, or do you take, do you have a, one concept and then all of a sudden you get halfway through and say, oh no, that we're going to do this. And How does that work? How, how? Um, the, there is um, there's a joy to writing a book when it gets going well. And the joy is when the characters start to talk to you. Um, one of my series, the Tony Valentine series, which I wrote for nine books in that series, I had a wonderful editor in New York who worked with me on the very first one. And I went back and rewrote it, and the characters started talking on their own. And they start doing things on their own. And things started happening. And to me, the, the, the great joy of writing a book is when I can go back and reread the book and be surprised. I'll be surprised. And uh, probably the, one of the surprises for me was, um, I'm, 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 I'll use an example. So I'm working on a book right now, and the character is, uh, he's a criminal. He's a criminal. I've always wanted to write a book from the point of view of a criminal. He's, he's a, a grifter. He cheats casinos. And he has a bit of a violent streak when people cross him. And it comes out in the book. And I just didn't know where it was from. I just didn't know. But it was there. It was part of him. 
and it's the world he lives in, and it can be a violent world. And then later on in the story, he's talking about the fact that he, does, he never really had a family life, you know, that he's raised singly by his dad. And then I read that I'd written, and his mom went to prison for stabbing a man with a pair of scissors. And I went, that's where the violent streak comes from. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no memory of writing it. It was just there. And so that's the real joy of a book, is that when you get into the heads of these characters, of these people, that things come out. They reveal themselves to you about them. Um, and I think that's where it makes writing books fun. You know, I'm often asked by aspiring writers, do you outline? Do you outline your books? And I do some outlining. But Ernest Hemingway said that if you outline your books, you know exactly what's going to happen, and so does your reader. <laughs> And you really don't want that to happen. You want these things to be a surprise. Because life is a surprise. Um, you know, in that way, is, to me, fiction really mimics life better than anything else, much better than film uh, or TV. Because they have to have some type of conclusive endings. And fiction does not. You very often are end left with very inconclusive endings. One of my books, uh, Midnight Rambler, ends with not the happiest of endings. And oh my God, the amount of people that have contacted me about that. Oh, you know, couldn't you have ended it this way? Couldn't you have ended it that way? <laughs> I wish I could have, but it wasn't how the story played out. That the book spoke to you. The book spoke to me, right. Well, did you find it a challenge making the switch from the Tony Valentine series to The Psychic Magician, which I assume is gonna be another couple of books? Um, I. Uh, the writing for me was, um, as I said, it was a second career, and I was very fortunate that my advertising business was a success. So it allowed me to do this as a second act. Um, and I never wanted it to become boring or to be doing it by rote or just churning them out. I wanted to be I wanted to write different things. Um, that was always my desire in doing this. I've also written some books of nonfiction about the field of magic. Um, and I just, so yes, it's a challenge to go back and, and create something brand new from whole, I think the expression is from whole cloth. But I like challenges. I don't like to be, um, I, don't, I don't like when it suddenly just feels boring or the dialogue is boring or it's just, you're just, you know, the expression cranking it out. Uh, I don't like that at all. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work for me. And I don't like when I read books that are like that. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm very partial to things that, when I see writers, one of my absolute favorite writers is Michael Connelly, who I, I happen to know because he lives in Tampa. He's one of the, the great guys out there, one of the great people out there. But if you look at Michael's books, if you look at this career he's had, He's had Harry Bosch. He's had Mickey Haller, who is the Lincoln lawyer. If you haven't read those books, read them, um, because they're better than Grisham. Nothing against John Grisham, because I love John Grisham, but they're better than Grisham. And then he's written books like Bloodwork and um, uh, a number of others, Chasing the Dime, these what he calls one-offs. And it's like he's constantly challenging himself. And I'm like, for a guy who has sold like, you know, a zillion books, that's really, uh, you know, inspiring to, to, to the rest of us that he continues to. And there's a book he wrote called Void Moon, which is about a woman who's a thief in Las Vegas. It's a fascinating book. And I have talked to him about it. Where'd you come up with that? Well, this, just, this character was in my head, you know. So that's great. So that to me is, Michael's always been very, very inspirational, um, you know, in terms of not always doing the same thing. Michael could just write Harry Bosch, you know, forever. And I think we'd all be happy because we all love Harry Bosch, but he's chosen to do a lot of other things as well. And I think that's what, you know, sort of transcends what he does. I would now like to open it up to the audience if you want to ask James some specific questions about the book or things that you wanted to know. I know I have one question. Okay. Liza wanted to kill her. <laughs> she was, I, every time there was something important happening, she's on the phone whining, 
and I just couldn't believe he would put up with her. <laughs> well, she's pretty good. I, I kind of like, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that in that. Here's, here's what I, here was my idea of Liza. Liza is, is Peter's girlfriend. And Liza, to me, is the, re, is the reality point. The reality point. Because Peter is, Peter's a psychic, and all of his friends are psychics, and he's never had a long-term relationship with a non-psychic, with a normal person. And this was the thing that was interesting, because I talked to some people who, who I believe are truly psychic when I was writing the book, and I asked them, well, what's your relationships like with your husband or your spouse or your wife? Very difficult, matter of fact, impossible. And I realized if I'm going to have Peter having a relationship with a real woman, and she is, that she's going to constantly be dragging him back to reality. And the reality is, hey, hey, what's going on? You know, it's great you're going out acting like Superman, but, you know, you have responsibilities. And not just to her, to the show, to his audiences, to his friends, to the people who work for him. And because that's the thing to me when I, when I see, oh, when I see films with superheroes or, or, or heroes and things like that, and they're rushing off to do things. And I'm like, yeah, but what about the kids? Yeah. <laughs> you know, who's taking care of the kids? Um, you know, that, that was the thing I, you know, I don't, I mean, that was the thing I remember seeing about our current president, that he likes to spend time at, you know, have dinner with his kids. And I went, wow, I don't think I've read that about a president since ever. Ever, <laughs> ever. He like he wants why? Because he wants to. He 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 has accepted he has to help them grow up. If he doesn't, there's going to be maybe his wife's showing him that. I don't know. But that to me was so refreshing, and it had an, that had an influence on me when I read that. That Liza's going to keep pulling Peter back to reality. It's like, hey, you can go save all these people's lives you don't know, but you've got to keep this one going. You've got to keep your life going, and. And she, that continues, I think you'll like her more in the second book, but... She continues, does she, Jen? Yes, she continues. My feeling when I got to the end of your book was that, oh, she's not going to stay with him. Once, one day she's going to just get out. Now, well, she, she figures some out, she figures some things out with him, um, but she also figures, there, there's some things in the second book about her where we start to realize that maybe Liza's not exactly normal either. <laughs> yes, Paul. Well, I, was, I got several questions actually. The writing to way into the night, is that what you're saying? You write way into the night? Yes. Okay, I, I'm writing a book about a nonfiction book about thinking, and, and I do that too. But I'm also curious about do you research these characters and, and certainly psychic world, and do you, or do you allow your imagination to bring them to you? And is that from things you had seen on television, people you have been encountered with, or is it just. The, like a new genre, therefore a new uh, release and bringing in new information without having a prior commitment to these disciplines. You know what I'm saying by that? Um, have, have, you know, have you had experience with all these things? Yes. Or, or is this all new? Well, I, I, my, I've had, no, I think anything I write about, I've had, I have some source that I can go to. Um, in, in writing about this, this the, the main source was the seances. I have many books on seances. Um, seances and psychics have always fascinated me. The psychic movement, which at one time was one of the largest religions in the world, started here in the United States in the 1850s, the Fox Sisters, and, and, and flourished. And so, I, and, and it, it has many parallels to the world of magic. Um, and so I had a, a real understanding, I felt, of that. And then I thought, boy, these would be fun characters. But the, you know, one of the things in dark magic that I that I did was that I, one of the premises is that if you go into a city like New York, like you're down to Greenwich Village, there's a fortune teller there, a little parlor, and my premise is that, hey, the real mind readers, the real fortune tellers, also have to make a living, so they have these little shops just like the fake ones, and and the, and the average person doesn't know the difference. But the customer knows the difference because the customer will be very loyal to the real ones. And so the psychics who are in the book 
all have these businesses that they do to make a living. They've got to make a living. And, you know, one works out of the Dakota, you know, beautiful, she's got very rich clientele, and one work, looks, works down on the Lower East Side where I used to live. And so I got the, and one works in the village. He's, one's a retired magician. He's made his living as a magician. Um, and so I, I drew from a lot of things in the world of magic that I knew. But ma magic is a, is a very complex world. There's a lot of things, and a lot of magicians have gone and done things like be psychics, um, pretend to be psychics. So That's the context. Well, what about the characters themselves? Do you spend time with them? I mean, do you spend like days and days just in your head with Warlock and, and just see where he, how oh, sure. you want him to evolve? Sure, yeah. Well, for, for me, the, the part of the evolution is you, you have an idea of what the character is in your head, and then you write, and then the character changes in the course of writing it. The character reveals things to you, and then, and then you have to go back, and that's where the rewriting comes in. Where very often for me, the last half of the book, the characters are now fully fleshed out, and I know who they are, I know exactly what they look like, and then I go back in and I fix the first half of the book, um, and that's part of the pleasure for for me. Again, I don't feel you can just simply draw, like draw a picture and say, okay, this is what this person is going to look like. Or this is what this person's going to look like. They have to talk. Um, in my um, one of my earlier series, there's a, a character named Jerry Valentine. And for people who've read that series, they'll come up to me and they'll go, "How's Jerry?" It's like he's a real person. <laughs> I mean, Jerry just speaks to them. He is the 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 son you never want to have. And unfortunately, a lot of my friends have had sons like this, and they identify with this kid. And it was actually an editor saying to me, make Jerry a small time hustler. Because he and his father were constantly bought heads. And that defined him. The book had already been written. I went back, I instantly all the lights went off in my head. Perfect. You're right, that's it. I went back and rewrote that character. And that's the character who became the very focal point of all the books. So do they nag at you, these characters? Or Jerry come back to you and talk to you and say, look, I haven't talked to you in a long time. Oh, sure. With me? Yeah, I want to I bring him back. That's what, and, and then the other part of it, too, is that you, when, when you start to write books, you get to work with some fantastic editors. Um, and editors and your readers will make suggestions. Uh, the process is, is such that you will are willing to listen to what other people have to say. I remember reading years ago, well, I, I, I went to a, a mystery conference in Las, Las Vegas, and the woman sitting next to me was the editor for uh, Patricia Cornwall for the Case Scarpetta books, which I love. The, the early ones, I think, are as good as anything exactly written. Right. Yes. That's, that's just in my question. But the interesting thing, when that book, the first book, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of it, um, but when the very first book in the series was submitted, uh, or the first draft, the editor said, that if you, if you know, remember the books, uh, there's a character, Scarpetta has a, uh, there's a side character, Marina. Well, Marina was the main character in the books. Scarpetta was a side character. It was the editor who said, Make Scarpetta the central character. And Cornwall was wise enough to hear her. And, you know, those books have been hugely, hugely successful. So part of it comes from, you know, one of the things writers have to do is listen. And you have to find people who are willing to, to you have to be willing to, I tell people this, and boy, it was the hardest lesson for me to learn in terms of writing and getting going from being a non-published writer to being a published writer. Most important lesson was the ability to bite my tongue and allow people who had read something that I had written to critique it and not to defend it and not to argue with them, but to realize they'd taken the time to read it, they'd taken the time to formulate what it was they wanted to say to me, and then they were taking the time to say it to me in a way that wasn't really offensive. They were trying to help. And too often, your natural instinct is to defend your work, to argue with the person. And I discovered that just you're not going to get anywhere. You've got to listen to what they have to say. Very often, what I do is I take people's criticism and I write it down. And I think about it. And then I'll call them a couple days later and say, 
you mind if I asked you some more questions about what you said? And it's really influenced all my books. It's really taken my books to another we have time level. For one more sure. question. One more question. Yes. Yes. I have found several authors where I too like the first books, but when you get to the fourth, the quality diminishes. Now, was your changing, your search for something different help that so that it doesn't happen to you? Um, well, I, I think what happens too is that, generally speaking, when you're introduced to a writer that you like, your favorite book is the first book because they're new. It's different. It's it's exciting. It, it and then as you continue to read more of them, it's not new anymore, and the first one continues to remain the favorite, whichever one it was you're introduced to. Well, my my publisher told me this, and I think it's pretty true. Um, what I tell people is, don't take a writer and read all their books in a row because you'll get bored with it. It's like having a house guest that stays for too long. I mean, it might be your favorite relative, but two weeks is enough, you know? And first, spur, uh, uh, I'll use Michael Connolly as an example. Michael's written 25 books. I, I wait for Michael's books to come out. I set aside a certain amount of time. I read them. 